Oh, hey, what's going on, Archons? Welcome to another episode of Key Thoughts, my weekly vlog on my musings on this great game of Keyforge. Uh, today, I have what some may consider a controversial episode because I'm going to be talking about a rule, a guideline, maybe some call it a law within the game of Keyforge that um, I'm no longer following. I've got some insight and I've been testing some ideas and my theory with this and it's proving to say otherwise to what was previously thought for some decks. So before we go into this, just want to talk about the card of the week. And also we got Keyforge sales still happening decks for cheaper than you would normally get and you can get them through me. So at the end, I'll run down that again. But first of all, for the card of the week is, uh, it's a fun card, and it is Font of the Eye. For those of you who are not familiar with this card, well, there's actually something special with this Font of the Eye. Boom. There's two of them in the deck that gave me the inspiration for this card of the week. And for those of you who don't know, Font of the Eye is an omni ability that says if an enemy creature was destroyed this turn, a friendly creature captures one. Okay. And uh, the reason why I like this card, particularly in a pair, is because you basically are having every turn the potential to take two ember from your opponent and capture it. So it obviously can be regained. There's a lot of things in the game that uh, can protect it. And at the very least, you can help take your opponent off check, slow them down, all those fun things, and disrupt their gameplay because now they have to, instead of maybe reaping, fight with the creature to get the ember off the creature that you've placed it on. So uh, I find Font of the Eye in a pair. This is I've had it more than once. It was just really hit home in this last round of game playing how strong that can be. Uh, there are a few things in this game that when you have them in pairs, they do a lot stronger work than just on their own. And Font of the Eye is definitely one of them. Even on its own, it's still a fantastic card. Having the Omni ability just makes it so good and gives you opportunities to make decisions that you wouldn't be able to without it, obviously. So, um, yeah, Font of the Eye, uh, I really like it. I think it's a fantastically designed card. I think it's a great addition to House Sanctum. And, um, yeah, if you got it in pairs, take a look for decks because uh, it will do things that will uh, really make your life easier. Now, on to the concept this week, which I alluded to as being controversial, quote unquote. So what I want to talk about today is the 2-2-2 two, two, two concept, meaning you have an opening hand that has two cards from each house. Now, we've had a rule that has existed since I started playing Keyforge that if you got a 2-2-2, two, 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 send it back. But lately I have found that I'm no longer following that rule and I've been leaning into the 222, embracing having only two from each house, taking it to heart. And it started to dawn on me that the 222 is actually not the worst thing. Meaning that I don't mind going 222. Ideally, if I'm going 222 though, I actually want to get another card from the two that I just played. So the house of the two I just played. I want to lean into it again. The idea here is that you are trying to save up a house, okay? And by having a 2-2-2, two, 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 it's not only saving up the house, but you're also not potentially getting hamstrung with just one house. You have an option to go to a second house potentially. And what you're trying to do here is get up to almost a full grip of what you want of this one house or get a specific card that combos off with that house. I know that sounds kind of confusing. Uh, as I'm saying this, I realize that may not be very um, helpful, but the instance I'm speaking of here is uh, the deck that, there's a couple decks I had, one of them being a DAV deck. And DAV decks, I feel for me personally, is I like to have one that has a specific house that has the majority of mutants in the deck. Now for me, a DAV deck with less than seven mutants, that's the very low end. Seven is my like absolute minimum and I'm not happy about it. Uh, you wanna get 10 plus for me is uh, feeling nice. Is uh, you wanna basically just save up all these 
cards from that house, potentially mutants, put, draw into your DAV and have a full grip. That's that's Magic Christmas Land. Because when that happens, you'll have immediate impact of playing down DAV, playing down your mutant creatures, and then drawing cards. So it's just going to have maximum effect, especially if your opponent has Ember Control. Okay, this is this is kind of a deck that really made me realize it. And uh, I helped coach someone as well with a similar deck, a DAV deck, and I was playing similar and I had similar results, which were successful results. What I wanted to see happen, happened. And I've had other decks that aren't DAV, but have the same sort of thing where when you draw into this one house, you actually getting a big benefit and you play it down a whole bunch. Now there is a secondary benefit to doing this. So let's say you go through this concept, you're actually drawing down, uh, you're drawing into this house, you start off with two, 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 you play one house, you get a little bit more, you play it again, plus you reap because you got now uh, a few cards on deck as well. Draw into some more cards, maybe you did some archiving, maybe you did some discarding from hand, things you didn't need, you know, things of that nature to allow you to draw a little bit more outside of the house, uh, playing cards, etc. And now you're in a position where you keep going and guess what? You got a full grip now. You got, let's say, five cards from the house you've been saving up, one card that is not, but you do not have that key piece, i.e. a DAV. Maybe it uh, could be an autoencoder. There's, there's different things that come into play that I think are, oddly enough, these are all artifacts I'm saying. Um, maybe it's a transporter platform. All these things that, you know, are crucial pieces to it. It could be a Dark Harbinger and you're looking and you got a ton of actions, right? Those sort of things. Those fun cards that uh, can swing things in a very fun way. But guess what? You have five cards in hand. Hopefully there's a bunch of creatures and you just lay down your board, let's say four creatures in one turn four creatures, your opponent, who knows what their board situation is like. Uh, most likely, I think on average, you're not going to see someone having a ton of creatures from one house at that point. Um, who knows how many turns it would be, I'd say it's maybe it's a minimum of three turns. Because of the fact that if you started with two, you played two, you drew into another one. So that's two turns. And then you play, let's say your third house, that's three turns. I think that's roughly sounds about right. What's going to happen is now you're stuck with um, this five card hand and you play them all out which means you're now going to drive five cards from hopefully another house because you've played some stuff so it's, it gives this interesting swing within the game that i've noticed but at the very least you maybe just put down four creatures from the same house and the benefit of doing that is it's almost very hard to respond to that especially if any of those creatures have elusive because the chances of your opponent having a match of four creatures that can go into that could be quite low at that point, especially if they've been uh, maybe not leaning into one house in particular, but spreading out the love. Uh, you could have a 2-2-2 board as well. It's It kind of works the same way if you're playing certain ways. So it's kind of interesting to think about the board state and how it can interact with yours. Because if you can put down a board state that would take more than one turn to answer, that actually gives you an opportunity to utilize your board stronger. Um, and um, the... I'm, I'm kind of going off rails here because I got a couple things down and it's also talking about the Delta factor from Bouncing Death Cork, which is board plus hand. But if you got the board with four or five creatures in it, that is something you want to take advantage of, reap out. Um, and the other thing you can also realize is that your opponent's board that they have, based on the house distribution, if you study the Archon card um, intimately, you will know where removal exists within the houses. So if you know they only have one creature in the house that has most of the removal, that's one thing. If they have two creatures from the house that has some removal, you'll know they only have one card. So if they call that, they can fight twice and maybe destroy one thing. That gives you an idea of the way they can respond and help you decide whether you want to move forward with a reap, take advantage. You can sit back and hold off for a second, whatnot. And, uh, it's a, it's kind of interesting thing. It puts you in a position where you just vomited a board that you can just keep calling over and over again. Uh, more on that uh, at a later date. So what I'm saying is the two, two, two can actually really help certain decks. I do not think it is a universal rule where you ignore it, nor do you play by it. As you get to know your deck more and understand, maybe there is one house within the three that really synergizes together and when it comes out it's dominant especially if it comes out in force you may want to actually craft your hand until that point more so the two 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 
to start the game, I think is less detrimental than later in the game, especially if in the 2-2-2 you have a less, um, a less impactful house within your deck and early on playing two from that and leaning into that one house to begin with. So you're diluting your deck of that one house and creating the odds of maybe the other two or the one that's very strong coming to you in a stronger force as the game progresses. Early game sacrifice, maybe it could be board, it could be, you know, your efficiency within hand can pay off. And I've seen it happen, especially when you have things, I think honestly let auto encoder and dav very much lean into this more so than others. Anything where you have ways of having higher efficiency, so cards like extra daughters, mothers, um, what else if you have like star lines that lets you cycle lay of the lands things like that which are going to allow you to go through the deck in a different way either you're drawing more looking at cards discarding cards things of that nature are going to help this theory just work better so that being said there is a time where i think the 222 does not make sense and that is if you have a very well-rounded deck meaning there's not something particularly special in any one house but it's actually like every house has strengths, then you may not want the 2-2-2. Two, two, two. You want to have those swings in your hand at any given time in the game so that you are able to get the most out of all three houses. Also, if you have a new deck, which you don't quite understand, a 2-2-2 two, two, two is not going to help. You want to see things in chunks so that way you can kind of start seeing how the, the, the puzzle is solved within your deck and understanding the discovery of how it wants to play. So all these things have to be kept in mind. It's it's not just a set rule, oh, play 2-2 two, two, or don't play 2-2-2 two, two, two hands. It's actually a matter of understanding your deck. So once you have some understanding in deck, especially that one house is very strong and there could be combo potential, I think the value of just going, oh, I got 2-2-2, two, 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 I'm checking it, changes. You need to understand the composition of the hand you want within the house that has the strength in order to truly utilize this sort of idea and i know some people will probably agree and say you just want to cycle through your deck as fast as possible but what if you're cycling into something that's so unhelpful at the beginning and you mulligan a 222 just for the sake of that but you had one card like a daughter for example 222 with a daughter i love it i love that because i'm going to be drawing one more card um multiple daughters igors uh, those are the cards i absolutely love for this sort of concept when it's out of house of the one you want to be playing, I think some really cool things can happen. So that does it for this concept. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Have you tested this theory out? And if you haven't, please do try it out. And remember, it's very strong with a house that you want to lean into. So like a Martian generosity would be another one where this will work, where you save up your Mars and you're playing your other two houses to get to that point. Uh, archiving also helps huge for this as well. If you have anything that can archive, it's actually going to make this stronger because the house you want, you can keep archiving and uh, just build up even more incrementally and draw a little bit more. So uh, I, I feel like that's kind of obvious, but nonetheless, I want to say it. So please keep this in mind and uh, give it a test. Let me know your thoughts. Have you tried this? If you have not, um, give it a shot. Try it with a deck you know and you understand and you know the house you want to, to come out in force and give it a whirl. And uh, comment below with your thoughts on this topic. Uh, now on to the deck specials we have right now. So uh, if you hit me up, you can either, um, you can basically hit me up on Discord is the best. It's um, Boulevard Blake, BLVD Blake, number sign 3840. I will put my info in the show notes on this. And... Um, yeah, so we got Worlds Collide, AOA, and uh, Deluxe Archon Mass Mutation deals right now. And basically how it's working is Worlds Collide, AOA, up to 48 decks. So the Worlds Collide will become in display form. AOA are sealed decks from two-player starters. Up to 48 decks, $200 ship in Canada and the US. Okay, 48, 48 decks. Uh, we have Worlds Collide deluxe archons it's 385 for a case of 72 decks shipped if you want to get a half case which would basically be uh, three displays worth and that is 36 decks you can do that for 180 plus shipping the deal for 385 plus shipping is you're getting a case so there's a case discount and uh, that's how it works so it's 180 without 
and plus the cost of shipping to where you are, which will have to be calculated at time of checkout. So um, if you're interested in that, hit me up. Um, the AOA stuff, I know Ollie's was doing a blowout. We got it. We will have this for a minute. Uh, lots of worlds collide left. So if you're interested, please send me a message and I will hook you up. And as always, folks, may your ember never be stolen and your keys forged promptly. Have a good one.